welcome everybody to another great edition of our partner success stories and i'm really excited to have one of my good friends dan lee from red cup it today hey, dan how are you doing buddy i'm doing great how are you doing awesome man i'm really excited to have you and i'm really excited to have this conversation you know, a lot of our partners that may be joining here today are going to be looking for a lot of great advice. You know, and those of you that are here that might, you know, are out there in the ecosystem, you're thinking about, you know, what are some of the ways that people are being successful? We decided that we wanted to jump on this journey and venture down that path with some of our customers that are being really successful. And Dan is one of those great stars out there that's just killing it in the game. And we really wanted to just have you on and, and really hear a little bit about some of the ways that, you know, you're making a change and making the difference in your business and then also helping your customers. So, Dan, thanks for joining us, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Well, that's I'm awesome. Excited. Well, I'm excited to have you, man. So why don't you do me a favor? You know, one of the things that I like to do whenever I'm getting started in a webinar and getting to know somebody, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, bud? Sure. Uh, I'm Dan from Red Cup IT, uh, founder and current CEO. And uh, we've been, I've been running the company for 14 years now. I started the company in college at UC Irvine in California. And um, one of our we started out with just Craigslist ads and Yelp reviews and just grew the business from there. Uh, so we, I did just say Craigslist uh, ads, brother. What's I that? Love that, dude. Like, talk about nitty gritty getting started, man. That's bootstrapping at its finest. Craigslist, I love it, man. Keep going. Yeah. So we, uh, I mean, from, from, from college, nobody knew who we were. So we just had to build the brand over time and, and build trust through. Uh, getting reviews online, and mm -hmm. I, I feel like we were a bit of a pioneer in back in 2009, getting our computer repair business um, with you know getting a lot of good reviews on Yelp and Google and places like that when people were still using the Yellow Book back then to yeah. advertise their computer and technology business. So yeah. we, uh, we were always trying to be ahead of the curve in terms of technology, whether it's advertising or the way we uh, support our customers, the way we do customer service, um, things like that. We've always tried to have a, a big brand presence or a, be provide more customer service than and more value for our size and for our team's um, age as well. We were all really young at that point, um, but we, we wanted to be like a big company. So it, we've always been very ambitious in that in that way. So it it's carried over to now in the cybersecurity field, um, just never being satisfied with whatever's out there. We're always looking for what's new, what's better, what's trending. Um, how can we provide, you know, the, the most security and the most um, usability for our customers as well. So trying to provide a holistic solution is actually pretty tough. Um, it's really, really hard to do that because you have to talk to so many different people in the company um, at your clients, uh, you know, organization to figure out what do they care about, um, what kind of threats do they face, um, and then what, what kind of people do they have internally, and what's the culture, what's the mindset there? Are sure. they even a good fit for our service as well? So really, it's about the people here and the people there. So we have to find a really good collection of people at our company and then find a really good collection of customers and partners and vendors to work with so that we, have a, we build a good ecosystem where we can all work together to achieve, you know, achieve our goals, which is uh, build great businesses and provide a lot of value to our customers and our customers' customers and just the general community. So it's been oh. a really fun journey, um, but very, very challenging. Oh, I know. I know it all too well, my friend. It, it, I love the fact that, you know, where you, you come out, you, you're advertising on Craigslist, you got a PC break fix business, and you started to pivot toward, you know, listening to what your customers wanted. And I love that fact, you know, I think that that's one of the challenges, you know, for many MSPs today is, you know, as I talk to a number of them, you know, they always are saying, you know, what are some of the things that people want? And I said, you got to ask, right? And you have to understand, like, you know, who the right customers are for what you want to be doing. And I love the fact that you found that. And I've, I've, heard, I've talked to you much in the past, and, and I've been really impressed with what you've created. But one of the things that I think I really enjoy about it is the fact that what you just said, and I don't know that very many people that are here today and those that may be watching in the future uh, caught it. But one of the things that you said was you knew who your customer type was. 
tell me a little bit about like your ideal customer because I know that that's a challenge for you know a, a lot of MSPs that are thinking about you know selling this to anybody right tell me a little bit about what your ideal customer type looks like uh, our ideal customer type are, are financial services companies healthcare companies and regulated businesses and um, enterprise b2b SaaS companies that have a software platform they're technology companies themselves however they need to focus on their products not necessarily the internal it that it, you know, supports the people building the product and maintaining the products and supporting the product and supporting their customers. So, you know, you can, re, you can use internal resources for that or which is a cost center, or you can re, use your limited internal resources to build product, which you can lever on to create, you know, 10 X value versus it. If that's not your core business, then maybe that's a one X, two X, three X value, but right. your software that you're building could be a 10 or a hundred X or be like an Uber where it grew 5,000% over 5,000 X <laughs> over a few years. Yeah. But you know, IT is not their core. So even companies like that would need an MSSP or MSP. You know, and I like that, you know, and I, I, I talk a lot about this, you know, and I have an exercise that we do, uh, you know, what your customers aren't telling you. And it's really understanding what you do. Right. And I say this all the time to a lot of people that are starting off. So for a lot of our customers and then that ask questions, so like, what do you do? Like, tell me what it is that you do or what is it that you want to do? And then line up those customer types that make sense for you. Because really you want to ask the questions that lead back to what it is you do. And I love that you have that set up, you know, and it ultimately at the end of the day, it boils down, you know, obviously you have a good focus on the industry and the customer type. I'm curious, Dan, you know, and you don't have to unpack your secret sauce here, but like, as far as like when you're thinking and having those conversations with customers, obviously, you know, where the pain is and you know, where you know how to have those conversations. What does your cybersecurity stack look like when you're addressing pain with your customer types? Like we, what is it? I mean, you don't have to give me names of vendors by far, but obviously hackware is one of them because we're, we're here today, but right. you know, we're proud to be a partner of yours. But what does it look like? I mean, when you're thinking about like the types of cybersecurity products, what are some of the things that you're you're including or or thinking about? Sure. Uh, so I think the, the biggest pain point um, in IT is probably authentication, passwords, yeah. getting logged into hackware or getting logged into whatever tool you're using is the first step. And whenever you're rolling out a new tool to the customer or even shipping a computer to a customer, providing it in office, the first thing is, how do I log in? So making that as seamless as possible will be our, our first priority. So then, then you go backwards. How do I know how to provide that to that person already? Then I would, I would need to know who they are. So then how do we receive that information? Traditionally, it's via email. Somebody emails you or calls you or um, <clears throat> just walks up to your desk and tells you, hey, I have a new hire starting Monday. Can you make sure that 50 tools are ready for them by Monday? <laughs> um, Love that call. So, right? And, and uh, so you start thinking about that. You have to re reverse engineer the solution or what the customer cares about is the end goal. They want a good experience. They want this person to start Monday and they're telling it on Friday, 5 p.m. And how do you do that? You have to automate. You have to think about all of these workflows in advance and build that in advance so that when they ask for that on a Friday at 5 p.m., you can just click some buttons and it it takes over and it does it for you. And then for us, we can do quality control versus focusing on actually hands-on doing all that work. Yeah. So the first thing that we focus on is identity and, and authentication and how do we get ingest that data efficiently. So we leverage um, cloud-based tools that like for, we build forms, customers can fill in the information via forms. Then we use no code, low code, code tools to pipe those that data into our other um, tool, like SaaS tools, to basically sure. provision that user as well. And, and then we also leverage, obviously, MDM and RMM to install agents on these devices so that the users can log in with um, single sign on their desktop. And then um, tools like password managers are deployed automatically. Uh, collaboration tools like Slack, Teams are deployed. And so, in, 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 in our company, uh, every time we hire someone, we tell them like, we don't install things here manually or reactively. We deploy things. We're an IT department that deploys things. We don't get computers and install it every time, or we're not doing USB ins installations via um, like that, or using a CD to install things or using scripts. 
and running, even with scripting, why would you want to run 30 scripts? You want to use a tool that can run, you run right. one script or click one button, then that tool will push out your 30 scripts. So um, you just keep going backwards. Then the question is, how do you even get the agent on the computer? So for us, we set up um, DEP with Apple and ABM. On the Apple side of Windows, we make sure that all of our customers have autopilot. If they don't have autopilot yet, we get that going first before we do anything else. So we're, we're not going to go and just do the easy thing first, which is just manual install everything and then do autopilot later. We'll say, no, nope, we're going to do autopilot first. And then right. autopilot will then push RMM. Then RMM will push everything else. So that, yeah. that's a much better solution. Otherwise, you end up with a hodgepodge of uh, manually installed tools, which you have to rip out and then redo again. Agreed. Agreed. I, I love that. You know, you're, you're living in the future that I once saw coming. And I remember we talking about this with a good friend of mine, Matt Lee, as we started talking about the world of automation early in the early in 2015, 16. And, you know, it was interesting back then to be thinking about it and to see it today in its full actionable components is really, really a cool moment. So I'm really happy to hear that you've adopted that methodology. And it really is, I think, a testament to why you're growing so quickly. Uh, you know, you're showing, you know, the, the technical prowess that you have, but then also really illustrating to your customers like this, you know, really quick go to market strategy. And I think that's really where they enjoy it and then increased productivity too, right? I can get that employee and stand them up in less than 10 days where other MSPs might take longer. So good tear of the page on that one for you. I love that. You know, I, I, one of the things that I've been impressed with by, you know, some of the stuff that I've been talking to you, obviously, when we were having conversations in the past and really taking a look at the way you run your business, you know, I think that one of the special things that you're doing is really is aligning your, your industry customer, your customers to frameworks. Now, I know that that's something that, you know, I don't want you to dive too deep into, but are there specific frameworks that you suggest that maybe some of the MSPs that may be listening that they might be interested in or things that, you know, you found uh, valuable? Sure. I think um, 800, NIST 853 is a good starting point. And the critical security controls that CIS provides is also another great um, starting point as well. It's, they're, ver they're much more prescriptive compared to HIPAA or SOC 2, where it, there's a lot of leeway and, and flexibility with these, with those guidelines. And so uh, it's, it's hard for us as technologists to figure out, okay, here's a bunch of words, but does that mean I enable or disable the setting or leave it alone? Yeah, so yeah. CIS, CIS is a great way to, to go into that one control and figure out how does that apply to this tool? And then should I enable, disable, and how does that affect it? It gives you an idea of, this is what happens when you click this button. Yeah. And I, I like that those benchmarks um, pretty much walk you through that. But those guides are about, could be hundreds or thousands of pages long. So it's, sure. it takes time to, to consume that. But a lot of that's what IT is, is read the manual, right? So if you don't read the manual or read the documentation, you won't understand um, what it is that you're supporting the customers for. So if you just wing it, um, which um, you know, honestly we had to do for a long time, and so we could scale to the point where we can hire resources or just spend so much time reading and studying that we can understand how everything works together. Mm -hmm. But the, the, I think those are some good uh, starting points. Oh, CIS yeah. and, and you know that's one of the things you know for us too. I think you saw the debut of that. You know we're focused on you know working with GRC platforms to validate that we meet control number fourteen, and you know also with some mm -hmm. of our relationships with Pax Eight and others that we're really, you know, putting our foot forward to help make sure that we as a company, as a partner to you can address those so that you're not having to ingest it and read it and understand it to that point and be like, all right, well, does Hackware actually do that? We're actually self-validating and then having third-party GRCs like Aptiga then also validate us as well and saying, yeah, look, they meet the requirement and here's all the reporting behind it. So. I love the fact that you're doing that. And I think it's really meaningful because I talk about MSPs that are in practice, have a practice or best practice. And I love that you're leaning into that best practice methodology and mindset, because it really, I think at the end of the day, will help your, your customers recognize the clear differentiator because you're not probably the cheapest guy on the block. You're probably fairly priced and, and, and maybe even on the high end because of the fact that you offer such a great amount of value. And I don't think any of your customers probably balk at that, right? 
I'm pretty sure they're probably like, oh, well, that's a little bit more than I was paying, but I really do need it. And so with that, I love the fact that you're doing it. But one of the things that I like to also find out is, you know, you're in a special space, right? You're, 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 you're actually leaning into the far right, as I like to say, with you know, best practices. What are some of the things that your customers are asking you for? Like what led you to push to that corner? A lot of it was uh, driven by security and compliance, and part of that is providing evidence. So, are you doing the work? Are you, you know, are validating controls, sitting on the same side of the table as our customers, and then the auditors on the other side? So, literally, we're on the same. When we go to these onsite visits, we're on the same side of the table, and we're representing the client. So, in terms of the shared responsibility model or carve out, then the customer can say, "Oh, Red Cup handles this for us," yeah. so that we don't have to worry about it. So if the auditor asks, is the network compliant? Do you lock all your ports down? Then the customer just turns to us and says, did you, Red Cup, did you lock it down? <laughs> so we can say, yes, we did. Yeah. And is 802.1x on? Yes, it is. And once you know, once you deploy a Cisco switch like that, you can just export the, the, uh, the configuration, re-import it to another switch. So that's where we yeah. know that we should look for clients that want that ability so that we can hire the CCNA one time and build it out to the to that level and then we can clone it and customize it for other customers so whether it's a switch or whether it's a tool like hackware where if we're focusing on healthcare we can know that hey let's let's um, build a healthcare module with hackware so it's customized for that or if all of our customers are software companies and they all have developers they all have aws or azure or gcp then let's do some owasp training or let's do some software developer training what are ways that developers can get hacked or what does it mean to leave your firewall open your computer and then your Docker ports open on, your, on that firewall and then the Ubuntu firewall op as well open as well in the in the OS that's inside your Docker that's inside your Mac. Yeah. So that's all training. And so that's that's why it helps us to focus on three verticals versus just saying, oh yeah, we'll do everything, but then we'll have to learn all the different nuances of manufacturing or legal, um, et cetera. So it's better for us to focus on that versus um, trying to go too wide. And I like where you're going with that. Again, I, you know, I, I, and I want everyone to catch what he said. He's focusing on a couple of customer types because they meet the requirements that he can deliver. And I love the fact that you said sitting on the same side of the table. That's why this virtual background is what it is, right? I love sitting at the table, right? Like that's the seat that you want. And as a trusted advisor, which you just said, when they look to you and say, is it done? And you say, yes, that is building trust. Right. And that's what every every company wants when they say trusted advisor. I think we've lost our way a little bit, you know, and, and this is the moment where I love to hear that it's coming back and that that you are leaning into that to become that and are able to prove that because that's where it's at. Right. The hardest part about, you know, the break fix error that you talked about coming from was we weren't able to prove that we did something. We fixed it. They said, I don't know if it costed that much. And you were like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll like give me 50 bucks instead of 75, right? Like that right. put us back because we really couldn't prove the amount of time that we spent on it other than just recording it. Now you can, right? You, you got an auditor that's coming in and sitting down at the table and they're like, did you do it? And you're like, yes, here's the proof. And here's all of the proof. Like here's all of the time that went into creating that and all the structures and proficiencies and processes that's tangible and customers love seeing that. And so I will say that allows you to push that limit on revenue targets as well with that mm -hmm. customer, because now they, the perceived value is not just perception. It's a reality, right? It's like, okay, well they did, they straight up got us through the audit, man. We love you guys. Thank you. Like that was, right. yeah. so I love that you're doing that. I think those are special moments and you should pride yourself on it. I, I love winning, right? And so I love being at that table. And when you see an auditor come in and you check all those boxes and you're just like internal high five on the way out, right? So I, I love yeah. Hopefully you celebrate that as a team. We do. And I, I think even the auditors are very happy as well. Instead of having so many findings or mediations, yeah. we've already done the work. You know, every time our customer gets audited, we get audited too. Sure. And so in the last... Three weeks, uh, we were we were getting audited. Our two of our customers were getting audited at the same time. So there were three audits going on at the same time, which was a little bit stressful. But we knew that we could deliver because we've already been through it so many times before. Yeah. And you know, when the customer tell, tells us, "Hey, the the auditor was very impressed," and 
we're most likely getting a clean report. And if there's any findings, our team is very quick to respond to any findings to remediate. So we're not we're not like a VC, so where you can tell the customer what to do, but we actually will do it and actually fix it and make it go green and get that checkbox checked. So I think that's the big difference between us as an implementer and an integrator versus a strategic advisor. And I think that's what sets us as a part as an MSP and MSSP versus a VC. So, uh, however, it's a great partnership to be able to work with a VC. So, because on the governance side, um, yeah. there's so many policies and Tons. things like, Hey, you know, do you have a board and does your board do this and that yeah. like have an external whistleblower program, or do you have an external, um, <clears throat> like, uh, like unbiased people on your board. Um, so those are different things that SOC 2 may look for as well, where that's not our specialty. So that's great for us to hand off to VC so and different partners that we work with. But I think um, having an ecosystem of best practice players will just provide way more value, which means, yes, we can charge more. But at the other side, we're saving headcount. The customer doesn't have to hire so many different full-time people to, to, to get to the finish line of, of SOC 2, for example. So. And I like that, you know, you know, leaning, kind of pushing into that a little bit, you know, one of the things that I'd love to share, and you just shared a couple of really great key differentiators, right? And one of the in talk tracks that you you were able to have built because of what you're able to deliver based on proof and your customers reiteration, like that builds confidence. And I love that because then you, you your team feels good. Everyone feels good. Your customers love you. you. The auditors are probably recommending you. Like that is a huge ecosystem of cool. Like I love that, right? And you know, one of the things is 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 the conversations that you have with new prospective customers. Obviously, you use some of that as as for instance, you can show that we've actually helped these customers by just scraping a name, but you can show their audit prior and then you know post and, and prior to your engagement with them, which is huge to be able to show somebody that level of, of uh, engagement and, and, the, and the motions forward. But what are some of the, like a good conversation that you normally have? Obviously you've already shared a couple tips of the way you have your infrastructure built, but what are some of the other conversations that you might have with a prospective customer that you feel like are really good that maybe you wanna share with the people joining us today? I think um, it's about education. So what I do is I have, I have a spreadsheet from the, um, uh, it's called SCF, Secure Controls Framework. And they have something called the CMMC Center of Awesomeness. So anyone can go there. It's a free resource. It's really great. And you can download it. It's a massive spreadsheet with multiple tabs and lots of columns. And what I do is I share to the customer that on a Zoom call and we let them know like, Here, here's all the controls. And here's some tools that we use to, to, to meet those controls. And then who's responsible for what, such as the customer being responsible for certain things and we're responsible for certain things. And then it's this, it's this big. And then when you zoom out so they can see the whole thing at once, and then they realize that, okay, maybe you know this company has spent a lot of time figuring this spreadsheet out. And the, you know that's how <laughs> GRC is typically managed, which is, which is spreadsheets. And it's still that way. Right. For many reasons. And once the customer sees that, they understand immediately, okay, this is what Red Cup IT can help with and assist with, and we can share this responsibility with them. We don't really want to take that all on ourselves because we'd be rebuilding their business inside our company. Sure. And, you know, we're like, a let's say we're a 150 person manufacturing company or a, a small startup, like a startup. And maybe we have two IT people or three IT people already. And it, it doesn't make sense to hire 20 more people to do what Red Cup has already done. Okay. Um, or, you know, let's not, let's not go and build a data center so that we can host it all ourselves too. And so I think by talking to the customers and asking them about what's, what's your core business? What, how do you make money? How do you make revenue? How much revenue do you have? What are your goals for the future? Are you planning to expand? Are you hiring? All these are business questions. They're not technology questions, but the way we deliver that for them is through technology. Everything that we do is technology. So nothing is not technology. Um, a process is also technology. And so we just ask a lot of questions and that, that are relevant to the, to the growth of that company. And that really gets them interested in thinking about business and growth. And that puts them from the 
cost cutting mindset over to the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And then we ask them another question we ask is, you know, what's driving you to talk to us. So then that reveals more pain points. And then we'll ask about who are your customers is, is a specific customer driving you to, to make these changes or um, are you facing competition, things like that, or what, you know, um, and then we can also bring in security and how, how do you leverage security as a sales tool? Right. And how do you build, how do you leverage security and trust as a sales tool? Because business is built on trust. Sure. And for example, we'll show off our trust center. If anyone's curious, you can go to security.redcupit.com and view our trust center there where it shows off some of our customers and our security program that we run. And that really tells the client that we've, we're at a different level than most companies where they don't even have a trust. Um, button and their footer. So if you go to any website, scroll, I scroll straight to the bottom and look at, look to see if there's a secure and trust link at the bottom there. Usually there's a privacy policy in terms of service, but where's security and trust? So if you have that, it shows that you've thought about it. If you don't have that on your footer of your website, you haven't thought about it yet. I like and it. so having a, a good website with a good site map and that's well thought out means that before you even got to that point, you've already mapped it out far in advance to get the content there, the images, the text, and all that data there, right? So, well, and, and to your point, you know, for those that aren't are here and are thinking about it, you know, customers are doing a lot of research and they, one of the no's you're going to get at the table is no, I don't know you, K N O W, right? And I love the fact that you found a way to bring relative value because they're out there looking, they're going to do a search, they're going to, who's this red cup company? Like, you know, who are the customers they're doing business with? Like, they're going to go look at your Google ratings. Like, they're going to go and look at all that stuff. And if you don't have that set up, to your point, I love that. So, you know, really setting up that conversation way before you have it is a kudos to you on that. And I, I have a feeling that that has a lot to do with, you know, as, as far as your website success and then also the customer success when they when you walk in. Like, they know about you. They don't. You don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. You got straight into the questions and you're like, hey... Like you probably read about us. If you didn't, you know, you probably know a little bit about us. Let's give you a quick overview. And then let me talk, let me start asking the right questions. And I like where you're going with that. I think that that's really been probably one of your, your better successes. I'm assuming, is that correct? Yeah, I, I think so. And we're working on now on, on documentation as well, like a doc, a docs portal that will just be public. So if you go to docs.redcupit.com, it'll have a knowledge base there where people can see what tools we use. We are not, we don't have a necessary, we don't need to hide what tools we use as an MSP. It should be public um, for, for us and transparent because for our customers that are larger, they actually need to know who, who's, what vendors are my vendors using? So that is vendor risk management. So, but if we abstract that all away or hide it, then there's not that visibility. So then our customers cannot be compliant unless they know who our sub processors are. So by taking that sub processor software model, we can pick vendors that are SOC 2 compliant or have yeah. you know uh, ISO 27001 done or, or HIPAA or some other, some kind of control. Uh, otherwise, you don't know what these companies are doing. And if you don't know what they're doing, then how do you trust them? Yeah. Or how do you begin to know what your risks are? You just take, um, take the part of All right, yeah. So. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kind face. You, you trust me, right? I used to say this all the time. I trust, I, I'll invite you to my house and have dinner at my table and, you know, trust you to the end of the world. But there's no way I'm going to give you access to my computer. I even give you the keys to my car, but I will not give you access to my computer. Why? Because I don't know what your cyber hygiene looks like, right? And so it's a similar thing where you're, you're doing a really good job at making sure that your customers are aware of your cyber hygiene because ultimately at the end of the day, they're measuring you up probably against larger vendors or potentially others. And, you know, how does, how did you stack up to your, to the competition? Like, you know, what, what are the things that I can read about you and what can I prove and know about you before? So, you know, obviously you've had some really stellar growth and we're really proud of everything that you've done, man. And we're really proud to be a partner of yours. Talk to me a little bit about how you're successfully selling cybersecurity. I know there's a number of ways to approach it. I know there's a number of talk tracks and thoughts. I know you're aligning with, you know, your stack and like kind of educating that customer, but do you have a, 
like say something that you'd like to share that's maybe a tip or trick on successfully selling cybersecurity? Uh, I think talking about the risks and the likelihood of those risks happening is in, is very helpful and, and storytelling as well. So I, I think um, telling stories that happen in real life or anecdotes is very, very helpful without revealing like who it happened to, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just incidents or just potential incidents or things that we were able to stop or saw, those are helpful. Or pick, if you don't have that, then, you know, go read the news and, and tell some of those stories in the boardroom and, and to your client and just educate them on what kind of risks, you know, are out there. Or read the Verizon data breach uh, report that is out every year. And that will give you a lot of data. And I think that's what um, business leaders want is, is data. They don't want to just hear that, oh yeah, I can get hacked or this or that. They want to see what's the percentage, what's the cost, what's it going to cost me? How much time is it going to waste? Then yeah. those, are, that, those are things that business people care about. Not, oh, I have CrowdStrike and, and Central One and ThreatLocker and Huntress and all of these tools running at the same time. They re don't really care about that. What they care about is they just don't want to get hacked or if they want to hire 50 people in the next two months, they want all 50 people to have a great onboarding experience. Yeah. Um, or if they want to open a new office, you want to make sure it's consistent with the office there you have, or, you know, if COVID happens and then you need to go work remotely, you can without causing a data breach internally. I know. So that, you know, the, all these things are happening all the time. And I think they want the delivery, not the how. So sure. um, that's pretty much uh, how, how we sell cybersecurity is through storytelling. I like that a lot. I, I think that it's very important to make uh, it real. Source, to, but that could potentially cost them time money. Yeah, <clears throat> we also talk a lot about insider threats and legal as well. So, you know, what happens if you don't own your data, if you trust a third party, like a, a marketing company and the marketing company revokes your access to your Google, to, to their Google Drive and all of your data is in that company's, you know, your, it could be your website data yeah, or your demo or test staging website data. And what if they, you have a contract dispute and then they cut off your access and you lose access to it? that's going to impact your business. Is that necessarily IT or cybersecurity? Yes and no. But if, you know, at the end of the day, we make sure that the customer should own the data and they should own in their own tenant, which means that we should, they should probably have us help, help them manage it and help them set up their technology so that they own their data. And that way, if there's a third party issue or an internal issue where someone's trying to steal data from the Salesforce CRM or trying to plug in a USB stick and steal data you know, that we prevent that or we alert on it. Yeah. Um, otherwise, if there's not a control, then things are happening and we don't know until months or years later. Yeah, it's it's a tough road, though. And I like the fact that you're doing that, right? And I, I love that, you know, that you're you're pushing on that button and you're helping the customers understand. And I know that there's a number of people that are here today. And for those of you that are in here, uh, do me a favor. If you got questions for Dan, do me a favor, pop them over in the chat here. I know that... Uh, you guys are probably glued to your screens because this guy is just crushing advice today. But definitely do me a favor and put some comments over there. Uh, if you got any questions as well, I, th I think uh, he's a plethora. We'll, we'll answer the questions as we kind of come down to the end here in just a bit. But, you know, one of the other things I love that I love what you're doing here. And I, I, I absolutely 100 percent believe in your approach. And I, I did the similar thing when I built my MSP. But I'm curious. There's always things that uh, we wish we knew. And one of the things is, Dan, you know, I know that it's tough down this road. And for many of us in, in, in the world that I came from and built and, and moved on, I've been all about giving advice back to those of things that I wish I knew when I first started. Because my first one was much different than my second one. I learned a lot of different things the first time that I did the second time. But I learned. And I love to hear if maybe you have a, a tip or a trick of something that you wished you knew before you started selling cybersecurity. What, Dan, what's one of those things, Dan? And don't say don't do it. Like, <laughs> but what, what's one of the things that, that you might uh, give as advice for our, our audience today? I, I think in terms of cybersecurity tools, um, definitely try, try to not just do the, the two-week POC that's standard, but ask for more time, ask for an NFR, really get in there and use the tools yourselves. And I, we're a big proponent of dog fooding. So not just talking about things, but and and deploying it for our customers, but not ourselves. So 
we extensively test everything and vet everything internally and use it. We use hackware internally as well, for example. And every tool that we sell, we also use so that we're experiencing what the customer is experiencing, which is the empathy. So we can be empathetic to the customer's experience and realize like, oh, this tool doesn't have this yet. Let's put in a feature request on behalf of the customer. Let's go ping everyone we think that we know to go upvote that feature request so we can get that feature because it's causing pain across the board. And sometimes if you're not using the same tools, your, your, your customer will experience a lot of pain, yeah. although you won't even know about it because they're too busy to, to send in a ticket or send in a, a Slack message or pick up the phone and text you or call you that, hey, this thing's been annoying me. Yeah, right. So um, it's important for us to have as similar as of a, of a uh, setup that as our customers have. And I think the next thing in cybersecurity is a uh, culture. So mindset and our team, I think has changed over a lot over the years. And it's, it's come down to, I, I think my ability to realize that there, it takes a specific type of person to work at this company and then provide what we want to provide to our customers. And it's been really difficult. And uh, we use tools like Odesk, Upwork, LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, and all these tools to try to hire people. And I was curious one day, so I went to go look and I looked at how many people I've hired in the last 14 years. And it's around 250 people that we've hired. And wow. mm -hmm. we've, we've hired so many people and now we have a team of about 20 people. And so we've only kept around 10%. So sure. you have to try, maybe try out 10 people before you find the one person that, that fits for your team and your model and, and what works for your business and what works for your clients. And then also your company is always evolving. So mm -hmm. sometimes people are fit one day and then three to five years later, they're no longer a fit. So again, that goes back to the onboarding, offboarding and data and security and access. And yeah. so, you know, that's just part of business where the people come and go and whether you work for one year or five years or 10 years, you know, that um, you have to plan for that. And that, that also comes to documentation, which means that, you know, you have all this knowledge and if people are coming and going because people don't work at a company for 20, 30 years anymore, yeah. you have to realize that people are going to leave at some point. So make sure that you document everything that you do every day. And that way they have that institution, institutional knowledge that, that um, collective knowledge is not lost when people come and go. So their contributions stay inside the DNA of the company. But if you don't document, it's in the ether. So <laughs> documentation is also the number one thing that we're now focusing on, on as well. I will, I will tell you this. I love asking that question when I'm speaking at conferences on culture. And I say, can anybody in here raise their hand if they've documented their employee journey? And the reason for that is I'm curious, right? During the pandemic, there was like this huge shift toward employees leaving the organization. And it wasn't that they were leaving the organization because they had better things to do or whatever else excuses I heard. It was because I don't see myself being successful with you, right? And that, that was one of the real things that I looked at when I was looking at when we were building our org is how do we want to show them being successful? How do we document them being successful from the time they come in all the way through the process where they feel like they're being successful? And really what you're saying is really down that same, same you know, a cut from that page is that the more you document, your process is clear, your customer delivery is clear and you win, then I feel like there's an opportunity for me to be successful because I love this because we win all the time because the customers are happy and they may be unhappy, but we can make them happy. Right. And, and that's really important. And I love the fact that you pick up on that because it is, that is one of those things that I wish you, that we wish we could all tell everyone. It's like, document the heck out of your processes, because if you don't like the new guy coming in, you're like, well, I hope he knows what he's doing or she, and then you could line up with the thing that you probably will is I don't know what I'm doing. Right. And that lands up at your right. desk. And then you're like, Oh, how did you get here? So I love that. So one other thing I'm curious about, obviously, you know, you've done a great job of entering the space and being really successful at it and learning very fast. And I love that you're a student of education and you, you pay attention to the problem and you try to unpack it and learn it and uncover the opportunities within it. But, you know, if you're giving a, you know, we got a number of people here in the audience today um, that 
are probably starting out or maybe they're in the down their down their path on their journey or there might be somebody listening in the future what tips and tricks would you give that uh, about getting into the cybersecurity space even from a fundamental component obviously you're the business owner and, and you're running an organization but what tips and tricks would you have for those that are just starting off um i think get a raspberry pi and learn linux is one of them and <laughs> yeah, there you go make sure that you uh you know get if you can't get your hands on it, get some test equipment and just build your own lab and try to break into your own stuff. So if you have a switch or a computer, try to hack it or try to do something and and set up a control and then try to break into it. And that's how you can learn rapidly and not, not just via reading or watching videos on Coursera or Udemy, but actually getting your hands on. So another good resource is a cloud guru where you can learn and it'll let you spin up cloud environments. And then from there, you can build things and then try things out. I think a lot of hands-on is really how we can rapidly iterate and rapidly learn. I love that. And I do, I do. I mean, one of the big things, you know, that I talk about all the time is the best investment you ever make is the one you make in yourself, right? So, you know, upskilling yourself. I, I got to where I am today by starting off with certifications and learning and testing. And, you know, I remember I was working at a little place called AOL and, troubleshooting people's computers over the phone with my head on a desk, just trying to listen to hear what they were doing and not being able to see and tell them what to do was tough, you know, cause you're talking to non-technical people. Um, I mean, there wasn't any tech, wasn't even a thing back then. It was, computers were new, right? So <laughs> it's a weird world to think that these days now it's like, okay, let me go in a remote in and I'll just do it for you. But to your point, you need to know what you're doing, you know, and I love that. As we kind of circle back here and come to the the tail end here, you know, I'm curious, Dan, you know, cyber insurance uh, is a big topic. Yeah, you know, obviously aligning to a framework and helping your businesses move forward are, are really big things. And I'm curious, you know, obviously from a cyber internal cyber insurance perspective and then also an external cyber insurance perspective for your consumers. What are some of the tips and tricks you might have for, uh, you know, cyber insurance internally? Obviously, I heard you were doing your own audits. That must be a, a component of why you would want to do that. Can you talk about some of the quick benefits and some of the drawbacks of not doing what you do? Uh, sure. So I think by leveraging us as a provider, we can help provide what the cyber, uh, cyber insurance companies are looking for and fulfill that on a continuous basis basis so that if there is an incident, we can show that we have, Hey, we have proof that we, we did this. And, you know, when you answer yes on a questionnaire and you actually don't have that control or the control failed, yeah. that, that can mean that your, your, um, your claim doesn't get paid out because you're negligent or you like miss, uh, misrepresented your business because you thought you had it and, but you didn't. And. We want to make sure that our customers are answering those questionnaires accurately and not through um, not knowing better that you should have marked it no, but you marked it yes. And then, you know, these companies have, they're, they're there to, to make money. They're not there to save you. So they have teams of lawyers and they have all sorts of resources to make sure that they don't have to pay you out. Yeah. So they'll make you jump through a million hoops. So don't jump through them alone. Make sure that we're there as your partner to make sure that we can help you through that process. And it's important. And, and, yeah. I, I, to your point, I, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have another thought? Yeah, I was just going to, I was going to say that um, it's, we can, we, because we also help so many companies with audits and, and answering these questionnaires, we have a, a knowledge base of, of answers already. And then we can accurately um, not just answer the question, but provide screenshots of that environment where, okay, the firewall is set up properly in the Cisco switch and it's also set up properly in the, the Mac computer and the Windows computer, and oh, you also have AWS, then you probably have Ubuntu or AM, AMI is in there. That's also configured properly. Um, otherwise, wherever the breach happens, we want to make sure that everything that's in scope is is properly reported on and yeah. and answered. I will say I love that, and I don't know that how many of you, everyone that's joining us here today recognizes or even heard about it. But one of the things that I'm hearing a lot about is insurance is pushing back now. I was just sitting on a panel recently down in Houston with another customer of ours. We were doing a panel and the insurance guy on the very end was saying that his job was to deny claims. And he was a cybersecurity expert. And he said, you know, one of the things we look about is, is, is for every way that an MSP has not complied. 
And we are and insurance companies are now coming back for negligence against, you know, technology solution providers where they're saying, look, you checked the box and said you had it to get the policy. And now we're going to come after you if we have to pay. And, and it's really a eye opening moment. Right. So I do think, you know, for any word of advice. And again, I don't know if you heard what Dan was saying, but be careful of your liability. Right. Know that you can prove it. Know that it's something that you have trusted partners in your repertoire that are meeting those needs of your customer and then also being able to verify and validate. Love that to death, man. So, Dan, we're, we're coming to oh, the end. Really, we have... Go ahead. Really quick, sorry. This is really important too, is I require all of our technicians now to screenshot the work that they do. It's not enough anymore to just put some words in that you did the work. I, I require everyone to do um, screenshots now inside the ticket. Mm -hmm. So if, if the auditor comes down three years later, like, Hey, did you do this person? We know exactly who did what at what time. And it's in the ticket, but we also have the screenshot because anybody can write words, but screenshots are harder to, to fake. AI is not there yet. So, <laughs> um, at least in terms of it. So yeah. make sure that all of your technicians screenshot everything that they're doing in the ticket. I love that. At some and point, I, I think that'll save us all. Yeah. Change control is coming into the house. I could tell, I could smell it coming soon, man. It, that's like probably one of the next softwares that I think is going to pop in here is is a, a robust uh change control technology priority out there we just probably haven't ingested it yet but any other thoughts that you have dan as we come to the end of our our session brother yeah i think access control as well not giving everyone global admin for years and years mm -hmm. if you only need global admin for an hour to do some work and then de-elevate um you should leverage that so on, on the azure side there's pim and there's also other tools on the market that support different single sign-on um, systems as well, where you can um, upgrade your permissions, and then downgrade them for yourself or your, for your technicians and engineers. And that'll help reduce your tax surface and we'll just grow it when you need it and then reduce it when you don't need it. So we're also okay. implementing that internally for us and for our customers too, which is something that enterprises are doing. So that's my, maybe that'll be my last tip is look to large enterprise and, and look to other successful companies to see what they're already doing. We don't need to always reinvent the wheel. Um, but if you look to enterprise, they have all these controls in place. We just need to see what's something that an MSP can consume and deploy. What's what's multi-tenant friendly? What's MSP friendly that we can use to get that enterprise capability without the enterprise price and tooling and time and the lift it takes to get that put into that. Oh, that uh, lift. Get it into the working state. I love it. Well, as we circle here, we're getting ready to close out, Dan. I, you know, one of the real, I want to say thank you so much for being here today. I love your stories, man. I love everything that you're doing. I think that it's going to be a super success. One last thing I'm curious about, if you had anybody that's looking uh, at Hackware, what is one of the things that you would say, uh, tip, tricks, or other? About Hackware? Um, okay. I, I think it has a lot of really unique um, training modules. And I think it's very, it has like a lot of timely modules. So it's really great. Um, it's also have the also the um the the testing the email testing that is sent out um a lot of people get fooled by it and even i was fooled by it in the beginning too <laughs> and so i think it, it's pretty good compared to the other providers um and that's why we picked hacker i just liked how how um <laughs> yeah i mean it fooled me so they're gonna get you man everyone's gonna like this is, yeah. I think everybody in here has been fooled by it at least once. It's a great tool, right? I think that's yeah. the funnest part of being an IT person is, is that we can spot it and then we get nailed by it. And we're like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, I, so. I think it's uh, created a lot of uh, healthy, um, what's the word? I guess a little, a bit, like education, <laughs> but a little bit of healthy paranoia. So. In, in, in cybersecurity, you can't be too trusting. So it's always trust, but verify. And Hackware has been able to um, put a little bit of paranoia just enough into <laughs> all of our end users so that now they're always questioning every email they get. And we get, we actually have a lot more reports now, which are false positives. But I would rather see a, a bit more false positive than people just assuming that everything's legitimate, even from their own vendors. And I think that's what Hackware does that's unique is, hey, it's Juan from Hackware. And um, can you click this link to download this? this PDF to read this before the webinar that we have. And um, it's really urgent because the webinar is in 10 minutes. So click this right now. So that's like how the emails are sounding. And I, you know, it's, it's from Hackware to Red Cup. And so it's, it's highly relevant. So it's, it's easy to fool, but you have to 
read it a second time and make sure that it's really from one and not from uh one three two one at at (laughs) aol.com yeah i don't have an aol.com email address anymore unfortunately but it it definitely uh from definitely one at hackware.com does work so if you want to get a hold of me yeah that's one way dan how can people get a hold of you buddy uh they can uh go to my website or if anyone wants to chat with me i have a calendly link um, it's just calendly.com slash dan dash red cup it and people can book time and i'm happy to chat with anybody about anything really awesome and they can yeah. find you on linkedin as well right yeah on linkedin as well yeah. awesome so I want to say thanks again, Dan, for having having you here today. You're such a wonderful partner, man. And thanks for the give back, dude. Like everyone that's here, we all have, you know share laughs and love alike. And, and we really want to say thank you for all your great tips and your wonderful thought leadership. Uh, final parting thoughts, Dan? Uh, I just want to thank you as well. Uh, ever since I've met you, I've, I've, I knew that we connected right away. And and you've been so so helpful on our, our one-to-one conversations as well. And I've been learning a lot from you. And, I really appreciate you and everything that you do for, for us and for the community as well. So thank you, brother. Going. We'll continue <laughs> to lead well together, my friend. And I want to say thanks to everyone that joined us today for another wonderful partner success story. Join us next time uh, as we do a journey in with another great partner, sharing great tips and tricks that can help all of us grow together. So thank you so much, Dan. And thank you for everyone that joined us today. And we'll see you all soon. Goodbye, everyone.